Hello, Namaskar and welcome to the CAA show. CAA, as all of you know, is Conversations and Analysis and my name is Jaggi Basin. There is a wave of anger running in the country today. The country is quite simply outraged. It is outraged by the sight of innocent passengers, by the sight of innocent children, two of them killed, felled by Pakistani bullets, a bus torn up lying in a ravine in the Jammu region. The country is outraged by these serial multiple attacks which have been carried out in Jammu by Pakistani terrorists. The country is outraged by the fact that some of our security establishment have been killed by these terrorists. And the country wants answers. It wants a response to these attacks. What kind of a response should the country give? Should we go to war or should we carry some other kind of response? These are the questions which countrymen are asking at the moment. And therefore, today in this podcast, I will give you answers to this question that what kind of a response should we give to this perfidious Pakistani establishment, which of course has pre-planned, it has carried out, it has targeted uh, these attacks on the very same day that the cabinet, uh, the swearing in ceremony was taking place at Rashpati Bhavan in New Delhi. The very same day Pakistani establishment uh, was in effect planning and carrying out these attacks on our soil. We have to give a response, but we have to give what I call a measured, nuanced and a very effective and a very lethal response to this outrage. Now, this attack has exposed a couple of things from our end, a certain fault lines from our end. The fact is, we have to admit to ourselves that even though situation in Jammu and Kashmir have tremendously improved over the years, but a certain degree of complacency had set in. And the fact is, let us admit that to a certain extent, our security forces were caught napping uh, literally as these attacks took place. This was not a single attack, but a serial number of attacks and only nobody knows really that how many teams of these Pakistani terrorists are operating right now or have infiltrated in the Jammu region and probably more attacks could be in the offing. We just don't know. And therefore, we have to give a response to this outrage. So, as I said, a certain degree of complacency, a certain degree of that, uh, oh, we can respond anytime with a balakot type attack, that is certainly not what I'm recommending. And therefore, I would start the, this podcast by giving you my own interpretation of what kind of response we should do. And the first response actually we should uh, give to the Pakistanis is that we are certainly not interested in going to war against Pakistan. We are not interested, at least at the moment, of taking back Pakistan occupied Kashmir. But we first need them to pay up. We first need to extract a prize from them of this outrage which they have committed. We first need payback, as it is called, for this particular outrage, then all those big existential questions of war, POK, etc. can come much, much later. That is actually not the need of the hour. But we have to give what is called a tit-for-tat response. And how best to carry that response, I'll give you my interpretation of that. To my mind, it should be an Israeli-like response, but without all the facets of that Israeli response. There are some aspects of the Israeli response which we need to adopt and carry out, but leave out certain aspects. And I'm going to talk about all that in this particular podcast. Now, first understand this. Pakistan is not Gaza. Pakistan is not Palestine. Pakistan is not the Hezbollah. Pakistan has one of the largest and one of the strongest armies in this entire region. It is also a nuclear armed country. And I know you would say that we have heard this argument before about them being a nuclear armed country and we carried out the Balakot strike and they could do nothing about it. True, I agree with that. But we still have to take these factors into cognizance. And therefore, what I'm saying is that all this talk of war, all this talk of taking back POK, of launching this huge attack on Pakistan by a 
number of right wing podcasters to my mind is very foolish uh, quite stupid a new government has just come in it is in the process of settling down let them do that but it is also a time for intelligent nuance a different kind of thinking how best we should carry out these responses so therefore stop talking of all this war talk and let's start thinking of how we as we say we pay gap we extract payback from the pakistanis i think at some platform or the other the first step is that there needs to be some kind of a declaration now the declaration obviously has to be carried out by very senior people in the government maybe by the prime minister i really don't know about that but a declaration and is really like declaration that for every one person you kill on our side we will extract a prize of 10 people from your side 1 to 10 or whatever ratio you want to face but it has to be a ratio where the pakistanis feel the heat where they feel where they where they where they are fearful that what is india going to do next if that becomes a policy enshrined in a military calculus then we uh, can send the fear inside these terrorist ranks inside the military establishment in pakistan and they would hesitate or at least think twice before carrying out the next attack one for 10 now how do you do this one for 10 you don't do this one for 10 by sending in tanks or sending your fighter jets or launching missiles on pakistan you don't do that <coughs> sorry you do it by a totally different way and i'm going to outline certain steps how you do and achieve this 1 to 10 ratio many of these steps are probably already being taken by the security establishment that is our security establishment many of these steps you might have heard of or they are already there in the public uh, discourse but it's not a bad idea to reiterate some of these steps something new might emerge from them and therefore let's start with step number 1 what we need to do before we even send teams to interdict and eliminate terrorists we need to do a lot of groundwork the first step of the groundwork we need to in the first place if we are, if we don't already have we first need to have eyes and ears both in the jammu region in these affected areas like in doda or in rajouri and all these other areas and we need to also have eyes and ears eyes and ears also on the other side that is on in the pakistani military establishment as well as within the terrorist ranks we need to have eyes and ears that is Uh, technically there is a word which is used for it it's called human it intelligence that is human intelligence on the ground if we already have it wonderful great but we need to step it up we need to give them more pass we need to give them more money that is the need of the uh, step up by human it intelligence eyes and ears and eyes and ears uh, also besides india and pakistan but also in countries outside in, in like for instance the uk for instance there are a lot of meerpuris from POK Pakistan occupied Kashmir who are in uh, the UK uh, step up your human intelligence there also we need to uh, 24 into 7 monitor the chatter that's going on between these terrorist groups between the military establishment of Pakistan and these terrorist groups we need to keep our surveillance because and here I'm going to come to the big point which I want to make in this podcast is that responding to pakistani games responding to the pakistani uh, uh ploy of unleashing its terrorist infrastructure on us is not a balakot kind of response uh, that was great when it happened or one such one off response maybe once in 10 years or one in 5 years that is fine but what we really need to do is to have a 24 into 7 policy of surveillance of interdiction and elimination of pakistani assets 24 into 7 all the time that has to be the centerpiece of our policy against pakistan because please remember if nothing else as i say there's always a bit of a silver lining in a dark cloud this is a huge tragedy which has happened for us for indians but the silver only silver lining is that finally after these attacks in jammu probably 
some of those idiots in this country who are always talking about the fact or do a rapprochement with Pakistan. I, I, I was uh, listening to this lady, Radha Kumar of the JNU, ex-JNU, whatever, and uh, on Al Jazeera channel. Again, these people keep on make a virtues to Pakistan, talk to Pakistan, uh, the Farouk Abdullahs and all these other people. At least, if nothing else, at least should be clear to them that there is no talking to Pakistan. You don't talk with a country where it's now its DNA is made up of a terrorist DNA. It has gone so deep inside Pakistan that this is a way of life for them. They can never take it out of their system, really. Uh, if nothing else, these attacks prove that. So forget the talking. We really need to deal it in a way we see fit and hit them at a time and place of our choosing and not against this so-called pressure of going to war or scaring out another huge Balakot strike that is not necessary, that is not needed. And therefore, as I said, pick up the charter, step up a human intelligence on the ground, that's the first step. Number two, we all know that there are uh, this uh, there is this now this continuing saga literally of the unknown gunmen in Pakistan, and uh, there are no confirmations. There is nothing which has been said from our side. But if it is true that these are being planned and orchestrated from our end, then I would say well done. But we need to step it up even more. We need to carry out these targeted killings of these terrorist commanders inside Pakistan. What does it mean? What does it entail? It entails that you have to pump in more and more money to these assets. And that's the third point which I would like to make. Um, if the nation has to pay a price for that, then we should pay this price because this is a price worth it. We have to give in more and more money. Also remember, how do intelligence agencies work? For instance, RAW, Research and Analytics Will. It has a budget which is actually never declared in public, and rightly so. It has a huge budget. And therefore, intelligence agency need to have a huge budget, but I would say give it even more, so that more money can be given to your assets to carry out these targeted killings. Because they, if you have to carry out this policy of 1 to 10, then that literally means that the number of these assassination and killings have to be carried out within that country. And that can only be done if money flow is there, if money power is there. So step up the uh, channels of uh, distribution of this money to these channels which will carry out these hits of the unknown gunmen. Then surveillance and interdiction. That is another important component should be an important component of our policy. Why am I recommending all these steps? First of all, uh, just a little aside before I talk about surveillance and interdiction. As I said, these are all things which are done by the Israeli establishment. But please don't do two things which they have done. Even the Israeli army, the Israeli military establishment, which is probably the best and the most professional uh, and the most probably the most competent in the world, even that failed, we know, on 7th October last year because there were gaps in their human or their human intelligence on the ground. They got complacent, which probably we have also done. So all nations, all right-thinking nations at some point or the other slip up, uh, become complacent. Uh, this has happened to the Israelis also. And then obviously those attacks happened in Israel on 7th October, uh, where so many hundreds and thousands of Israelis innocents were killed. Uh, and uh, so learn from that. We don't have to go to war as they have gone to war against Ansa. As, as I said, Gaza, Pakistan is not Gaza. We should avoid those kind of, that kind of talk or taking those kind of steps. But rather take up the interdiction steps, the communication steps, the surveillance steps which the Israelis do all the time, which is a 24 into 7 job. That is what we need to do. Now, how do you do surveillance? And for that, I'm going to recommend two important things if they are not already being done. Number one is fast track. Uh, the purchase and the deployment of these MQ-9, I think, Predator drones. That's what they are called from the US. Now, these Predator drones, they fly at around 30 to 33,000 feet in the sky. Uh, they have excellent cameras, which literally to the last square inch on the ground, they map it out. They photograph, they know exactly the movement which is happening on the ground. And then they are armed with missiles, they are armed with bombs. Uh, and in the push of a button by drone commanders on the ground, the predator from that height can literally 
destroy an enemy target on the ground. We need those to carry out these attacks, not only of the infiltrators that are coming from across the border, but also for selected targets within Pakistan. The predator drones have therefore become absolutely vital in this new security shakeup if, if it happens. Number two, uh, our own Indian manufacturers like Adani, they are also making rapid strikes in drone manufacturing. Check with them what kind of drones now are ready for deployment uh, uh, with this dual purpose of surveillance and interdiction or uh, elimination. Uh, apply, deploy those drones also. But the short point being that you need an eye in the sky or rather many eyes in the skies which map out the entire area, the entire grid as it is called is covered by these drones because that is the best way instead of applying your human resources or sending in your troops uh, to chase these people, hunt these people and in the process so many of our security forces are also killed. You can avoid all that by the presence of these predator drones in the sky. But there is another development which has taken place and only in the last, uh, I think, a few weeks, the Russians, and we have very good ties with the Russians. The Russians have now come up with a drone that literally flies just a few feet above the ground. It is a kamikaze drone. What is a kamikaze drone? A kamikaze drone is a drone which has what are called loitering munitions. It is armed it is of course reconnaissance facil uh, 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 abilities also but it basically is a bomb it literally is a flying bomb which is sneaking its way through tree cover through foliage undergrowth on the ground and then it goes and ad identifies a hostile target an enemy target and blows it up we need to talk to the russians to get these specialized kamikaze drones flying a few feet above the ground, they should be deployed in the sector in the Jammu region, which can interdict the enemy and eliminate the enemy or these terrorist assets. So a large part of this elimination can actually be done by drone warfare. We really don't even have to use our troops really or put them at risk. Um, the moment they, they make an entry, the moment they try and hide in the caves in these regions, the moment they try and take refuge, we have to send in, uh, we have to deploy our eye in the sky. Keep track also then the other step is of the local population. Now, most of them are patriotic uh, Indians, we know that, but there are certainly some of them who could be giving, abating and abating and giving refuge to these uh, trespassers to these people who come in from the other side. And therefore, as I said, more and more eyes and ears on the ground. You need people who live with them, you know, with the local population who are there constantly all the time. They keep a lookout. They, they are monitoring all movements. That has to be stepped up even more on the ground. And then finally, we need what I call, what I call interdiction small teams on the ground. Now we have this policy and I say this from a little bit of experience in the sense because long back I used to be a, a, a correspondent with DD News and I used to do the Kashmir Valley during the height of the insurgency very frequently. And I've seen this with my own eyes, all these search and cotton operations and interdiction operations. And a lot of that stuff still continues. Uh, the Russia rifles do that. that. That's all there. But... I think what we do, which is not really required, I think, is that we sometimes use a sledgehammer to kill a cockroach or a fly. Which means, for instance, if there's a house where a terrorist is taking refuge, we blow up the entire house. There's no need for that. Uh, we, As I said, now there are these smart drones which have come into effect. Uh, I don't know if some of you might have seen a film. Uh, long back, there was a film of Tom Cruise called Minority Report. And in that film, they showed the future, literally, where these... Uh, this size drones. They used to drones which used to loiter all across the place. They could get into anywhere, through any door, window, whatever. And then used to go, they used to take photograph of the target or sometimes even blow up the target if necessary. So literally that future is here right now. We have those that kind of drone technology. So we need to, as I said, think smart, act smart, use smart munitions, use smart technologies to get the job done instead of uh, using the sledgehammer approach where we use a sledgehammer to swat a fly. 
And therefore, the last resort or the last thing should has to be that we create these small interdiction teams. When all else fails and these interdiction teams come into, uh, they, 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 then their job begins. And these teams are people who stay with the local population. They stay in the jungles uh, on a rotational basis. Let them be, let's say, there for three months and uh, then other teams come over. And therefore, you have a number of multiple such teams in the entire, let's say, in the wooded uh, areas around in the Jammu region. Teams of four to six people living off the lay of the land literally. People who are skilled in carrying, who are skilled in carrying out targeted killings, uh, who know how to spot the enemy coming from the other side, uh, engage them in sh uh, firefights and eliminate them. You don't even have to send all your troops and this kind of big. The troops are really, if you ask me, are really the deployment is of troops is like you do it in the big kind of confrontation like the one which actually that eye to eyeball to eyeball deployment which we have now on the chinese on the border with china they're really meant for that you need skilled specialized small interdiction teams skilled at targeted assassination targeted killings which are operating on the ground in these jungles but on a 24 into 7 basis there is no let up in this because if you think that there will be for six months there is peace and nothing is going to happen after that, after a few months, definitely attacks are going to come. That is the DNA, that is the nature of the Pakistani establishment. We just have to accept it. We just have to live with it. There is nothing we can do about it and we have to deal with it. We cannot run away from it and this has to be our response. So therefore, what I am saying is in conclusion, a 1 to 10 response against the Pakistanis. You kill one of us, we eliminate 10 of yours. We need smart technologies. We need uh, smart thinking. We need smart interdiction on the ground. Let's talk this nonsensical talk of war and taking back POK and all this rubbish which we keep on doing in uh, podcasts day after day. Because we, in the, what we only do by that thing is that we just delude yourself. We don't need to be delusional. We carry out, we this warfare is technological smart warfare but it is also very intense uh, it's a brutal warfare and for that you need highly motivated skilled small interdiction teams on the ground that's the way to go once we give that response once we give the one to ten response to the pakistanis hopefully things can change but even if they don't change this is the only way forward the israeli way but without uh, the other risk which the Israelis take. Let's take the best from different countries, from uh, some of our allies, what they do. Let's deploy their tactics and resources and the kind of resources which are now available. For instance, now the country is equipped with all kinds of loitering munitions. Uh, many of them are being made in India. Many of them already, they're both loitering munitions in the air and on the ground. We can do that. We can eliminate, but we need to step it up. We need to come up with a new crafted policy, a smart policy, a nuanced response. I'm repeating this again and again. We don't need a sledgehammer approach. We don't need a war with Pakistan. We need what is called a small hammer, which drives in the nails in their coffin day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second. That's the way to go. And on this note, I come to the end of this particular podcast. You like our show, the CEA show, subscribe to us. Subscription is, of course, completely free. Press on the red button. And I promise you, I'll bring you all the hot button issues of the day, always with a twist, with some new ideas. Goodbye and cheers from my end.